WSDQ Dunlap, WEPG South Pittsburgh, The Copperhead, WSDT Saudi Daisy, Chattanooga. The viewpoints expressed on Liberty Works Radio Network are not necessarily those of the network, its affiliates, or sponsors. This is Liberty Works Radio Network. Now live from coast to coast and around the globe, more real talk, the kind you want, on Liberty Works Radio Network. And good afternoon to all of you Liberty Works Radio listeners out there. This is the Truth Attack Hour, and it's Friday. It's 5 o'clock Central Time, 6 o'clock Eastern Time, and every Friday at this time, I'm your host. My name is Larry B. Craft. I'm sitting here in my office in Huntsville, Alabama, and I extend a warm invitation to you to listen to this program. Last week, I made a decision that over the next, oh, three, four, five weeks, maybe it's even two months, I would get down into a real detailed discussion of constitutional and statutory foundations for federal taxation. It seems like the American people really need this important knowledge. Well, today, we will be continuing with that task. And and assisting me in this journey through constitutional principles and statutory constructions is a good friend of mine from out in Mesa, Arizona, by the name of Gary Thomason. Gary, are you with us? Good afternoon, Larry. Yes, I am, and I'm excited about how we we are embarking on this uh, five-week, six-week, eight-week, whatever it takes journey into the constitutional foundation of the taxes and and how people should approach it. So, it's real important. Wouldn't you agree? Isn't there a need on the part of our listeners, in fact, a large segment of American society, the American people, to know something about all this? You know, I was talking to a, a mutual friend of ours today, Dr. Sizemore, and I think, I'm thinking that based on the conversation we had, there is so much to learn but it's not overburdening. It just takes some consistent thinking and consistent reading. And before you know it, you start to understand the foundation, and it's really not that complicated after you get exposed to the pattern. Is that a fair yeah, statement, it, Larry? Yeah, that, that's absolutely true. But, you know, people have got to at least devote some time to it. You know, you can, yeah, and devoting uh, time to it by listening to a program, that's uh, that's at least going to give you the foundation. But there's also a need for people to you know, immerse themselves in their own personal study of a lot of these matters. And what we're going to be talking about over the next, over, over today and the next several weeks, a lot of it's going to be posted over my website. So I invite our listeners to go over to my website and become familiar with it. Now, to find my website, it's real easy. The name of it is Dixieland Law Journal. The problem is, you know, back in July of 1997, I started posting this website on my Internet service provider, and it got to be so burdensome, so many, it was kind of jerry-rigged the way I built it. And it became almost impossible to move. But I've cleaned it up over the last couple of years, And if you want to get to my website, go over to an Internet search engine and type in either Beecraft Briefs or Dixieland Law Journal. And when you type that into an Internet search engine, it'll carry you over to a link to my website. So click on, when you do that search, click on the link that comes up, and boom, then you'll be there at the Dixieland Law Journal. And we're going to be talking about the material posted there over the next several weeks. Now, hey, Gary, before we get into this uh, discussion this afternoon, I think it's real important to, to uh, also indicate that we've got a bunch of craziness that's going on in this country. And one of the things that's really been surprising to me today, have you heard this story about this lady in New York that showed up at that AOC meeting she was having? 
Oh, and yeah. So she's obviously deep into the climate change hoax. But she said, you know, we're going to be killed in the matter of months <laughs> because of climate change. And the only way we can solve it to stop climate change at this stage is to, have you heard the story? Yes. What was her solution? Start, start eating our children. <laughs> yeah. Eating babies. Now, those people have been utterly brainwashed. And this shows that there's a lot of brainwashing that has been going on all throughout the 20th century. The government's engaged in brainwashing. And I think if you're on the right and have been watching what's been going on in the left wing, as well as in Democrat circles, you can plainly see that there is brainwashing in operation. You know, there's brainwashing going on right now when Adam Schiff and Nancy Pelosi, they come out and just completely fabricate things, and the press uh, uh, spreads their lies. All of this is an effort. And we can see it. It's visible to those who are not brainwashed. We can see the brainwashing operation that's going on. Well, the same thing has been happening in reference to the government and brainwashing the American people about its true power. And there's been a lot of brainwashing in reference to a lot of matters regarding the federal government. And what that's what we're going to be talking about during the course of the next several weeks. Now, Gary... Do you see the brainwashing that's going on here in America? Am I wrong oh. about this observation about what Nancy Pelosi and and uh, Schiff, you know, I call him a different name, but I can't say that on this program, Adam Schiff. <laughs> I got uh, it. <laughs> but it, it, isn't it obvious that there is a concerted effort to completely mislead gullible Americans and make them believe in something that is false. Well, you know, Larry, I, I've, I've always had a struggle with trying to pick sides. So, I mean, I've, I've always kind of considered myself to be a political atheist. I'm not a Republican, and I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a, so I'm not in for socialism. I just I like the strict construction of the Constitution, and neither party follows it. We just have to be honest about that. But there's some good congressmen on the left. That there's some good congressmen on the right. There's some good senators on the left. There's good some good senators on the right. They need to work together, and 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 then we need to get to a point to where the loonies are exposed, the lunatics. And then I think we could start to you know see how we can work together because there's no way on this planet that a average American citizen with with some reasoning skills would ever ever consider eating babies to alter the climate change. Wow! I mean that is that is so out there on the limb that you'd have to, you know you would have to be literally. Uh, on uh, some serious, serious drugs to actually even consider that. So yeah, uh, <laughs> but our you know, but our our purpose is to build up and understand. And you know, the federal government is, you know, I've, I've said it a few times over the course of the years, is that every time Congress passes a new law, they create a new class of criminals, and what we have to understand is that the federal law doesn't really necessarily apply in your home state. And if we if we start to put that and wrap that around the taxation, the taxation is not that complicated. We've been we've been groomed and correct me if I'm mistaken, but we've been groomed since at least the, the, the mid 40s, early 40s, to stand in line, fill out a form, become begin work, and consider yourself to be an employee working for an employer, and and you're going to get your you know W two at the end of the year. You go down to H and R Block or Sleeves, whatever Sleeves operation that uh, says that they'll help you do quote your taxes. 
and and march to that drum, you know. And um, I characterize it very simply as, you know, <clears throat> our parents were the first generation into this scam, and it, it's a scam to me. Second generation happens to be us. The third generation are our children. And, you know, we got grandkids, uh, they're the fourth generation. And I think if we don't yeah. have, if we don't gather together as a unified force to stop this, our, the fourth generation is going to, we won't have any, any hope of ever, ever changing so it. True. So true. Hey, Gary, we're going to be approaching a, a break here, our first break during the course of the program. But before we get into that, there's something I want to bring. Before we get into, you know, these uh, constitutional and statutory issues regarding taxation, I need to bring up another real important matter. You know, with something that's hot right now, you know, and, and some people are saying we're, we're ripe for another uh, uh, situation like this, and you know, a mass killing here in America. But, you know, the mass killings, all these uh, situations like uh, that happened out in El Paso and in and, and Ohio and, you know, down in Florida, you know, these mass killings, those are happening so that the government and gun control people can be promoting gun control. They ultimately want to take uh, our guns away from us. Related, you know, there, there's a there's an argument I want to educate people that oppose all this. I want to educate them about an argument that relates to gun seizures. But this also has an application, and this is when I was you know, first started promoting this argument to try to, you know, have an impact upon national health care. And here's the point that I want to make, and it may we may have to spill over uh, after the commercial break uh, to continue this uh, discussion. But there's a principle, uh, an equal protection principle, that addresses both national health care and gun control. Now, the 14th Amendment has an equal protection clause in it. You know, no state shall deprive anybody of the equal protection of the laws. Well, principles of equal protection are similar to due process. And so while there is no equal protection requirement applicable to the federal government, you know, the Supreme Court's come along and said, hey, look, these these equal protection principles are incorporated within the Due Process Clause of the Fifth Amendment. So both uh, the federal government and the state governments are subject to these principles involving equal protection. Now, what is equal protection? Well, you know, a legislature comes along and, you know, when they want to pass a law, they're seeking to address a particular problem. And the courts have defined, you know, there's been a lot of litigation over the last 150 years dealing with the problem of the reach, breadth, and scope of various state and federal laws. Now, let's suppose that drunk drivers pose a problem for a state legislature. However, drunk drivers are not going to be the entirety of the driving public. Let's say that Drunk drivers are only 10% of the driving public in a particular state. That means 90% of the drivers in a particular state, like Alabama, are not causing the, any problems regarding drugs. They're not the cause. Well, if, if the legislative body comes along to address a problem involving a minority or a small class in a society, and yet imposes burdens on everybody, that's called an over-inclusive classification. Now, we are looking at over-inclusive classifications both in reference to national health care and in this battle regarding, you know, the effort by people like Schiff and those other Democrats, and particularly Beto or Beto O'Rourke. We want to take away all of your AR-15s! You know, to say in the argument that the People that have the lawful gun owners are using against these laws that are going to impose on their rights. They need to understand that their constitutional argument that they're making is is that the legislation they don't like is going to break broad. 
Now, I wonder, yeah. Hey, folks, there's the music letting us know we got a first break. We'll be back in a few minutes. Stay tuned. And welcome back to this afternoon's show, the second segment, where we're talking about, oh, well, eventually we're going to be getting around to a little bit more of a uh, trying to educate our listeners about some really important issues. However, before we get to the purpose of this program, I've I've got this sidetrack. You know, I've started down, and I want to educate our listeners about it. It's something a little bit different, but it is indeed important. Now, in reference to these draconian proposals laid out by Beto O'Rourke, oh, we're going to take your AR-15. And he says that in response to something that happened in his hometown in El Paso. You had some guy that's owned drugs. Mind-altering drugs goes out and shoots up a, you know, mall. And Beto comes unglued. we got to take all of your guns. Now, the problem is caused by these unhinged, crazy people that typically are on some drugs. However, this is that, 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 that category of people here in America is an extremely small segment of American society. It is not lawful gun owners to come along and say, oh, to respond to this problem created by these, you know, wild and crazy drug-induced shooters. We have to take away everybody's guns. When you're saying that you're going to take away everybody's guns, a law that would do that would be over-inclusive in terms of equal protection. Now, the same Perfect thing example. applies in the field of national health care. Let's say that it's 15% of the public that is creating this problem as a result of um, you know not having insurance. Well, that means that 85% of the American public, they're not creating the problem. But to solve a problem created by a minority, to say that the legislative solution is to impinge upon the rights of everybody else, that means that that legislative proposal is going to be over-inclusive. Now, if you want to study a little bit more about this, go over to my website. At the top of the page on Dixieland Law Journal, You know, there's a, a link to another page, Constitutional and Other uh, Illegal Materials. Go over to that page and look down through there, and I'll have a file that's got equal protection cases. And I've got a number. I've got them divided out by jurisdictions. And there's a lot of Supreme Court cases, and there's a lot of... And I've got summaries of these cases and links so that you can go over and read them. But in this equal protection file on that page, I want to tell our listeners, go down and take a look at... There's this One of my favorite cases dealing with this equal protection problem is this. There's a case called State v. Mikowski. It's a 1985 Nebraska case. And if you could, you know, if you understand this one basic proposition found in this case, it will explain all of this. It puts this this concept into um, uh, some easily understood two sentences. And let me read to you what the Nebraska case of State versus Michael uh, Michaelski has to say about you know this is what uh, these equal protection principles uh, or the, the refined essence of them. An over inclusive classification burdens a wider than necessary range of individuals. Burdens a wider than necessary range of individuals, extending beyond those persons possessing the trait contributing to the mischief or evil the legislature seeks to eradicate. Now, that, 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 take that principle in just in that one sentence, an over-inclusive classification. 99% of the American people are not creating gun problems. It's only a minority. But to, the, but to say that the legislative solution to this problem created by the minority involves taking away 100% of the gun-owning public's guns, that is 
burdening a wider than necessary range of individuals, extending beyond those persons possessing the trait contributing to the mischief or evil the legislature seeks to eradicate. Now, that is the problem that we have in reference to all these gun proposals. That's the same problem that we've got with Congress using a problem created by a minority in this country regarding health care. Oh, they want to come along and burden everybody, including people that are not creating this problem regarding health care. To come along and say, and this is a real problem, this is something the American people need to know, and there's probably going to be some similar proposal come down the road. You know, we're seeing just with these two situations involving national health care and these proposals for gun control, we're looking at legislation that is over-inclusive and consequently constitutes an equal protection problem. And there's something coming down the page we don't even see right now where this issue will be the defense we need to, uh, to use. So I, I invite our listeners to you know, get involved in, in, in a study of these equal protection principles that I've got explained over on my website. And then, then you can look at these great social political events here in America and, you know, look at them from a constitutional viewpoint and see we have a, a solution to address these problems. Now, Gary, is that uh, an adequate explanation? Larry, it could, could be made more clear. In fact, I was sitting here thinking while you were explaining, I said, you know, if, if we were to invite our listeners to you know, either, you know, contact me, contact you, and, and start a campaign of write your congressman and say, we want equal protection under the laws and, and censure somebody like these, uh, these clowns pretending to be congressmen. Uh, just, just, they're set on go to take everybody's rights away from them. And, uh, start a campaign across the country to say, hey, you know, we want the laws written to address the issues that they're designed to resolve. And we don't want you to mess with us, especially since we're not the ones causing any problems. Yeah. So uh, if the if the listeners out there would just get a note notepad and a, and a pencil, um, send me an email. It'd be uh, Gary at npn.net. So you and, want our uh, listeners to send an email to you, Gary at npn.net, and what do you want them to do? Uh, say, hey, let's get proactive. And this is not a tax issue. This is a liberty. This is a constitutional issue. Yeah. And, hey, leave my rights alone. If I'm not the one causing any trouble, don't drag me into this this group that you want to uh, control. You know, it's like you know, you, you know, we started the, the the program off today, and things are going to be changing. And there's there's the uh, you know the 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 brisk winds of of change about uh, they're they're predicting that something's going to happen. Well, you know, there's what they're doing is they're just they're just creating another another opportunity to say. We've got to take everybody's guns. We got to take everything. You know, nobody, nobody can have any freedom anymore. And it's starting to sound like, uh, you know, the Bolshevik Revolution all over again. Yeah. But hey, send me an email if you're interested. We'll put a little letter together, send something out to our congressman, and you know, and invite your friends. Build build a database of of people who want to really get involved to say. Hey, we we need to stop this madness because these people are out of control. And Larry, tell me if I'm nuts. Can you imagine somebody passing legislation that that requires people to eat to their children? Wow, 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 wow. I mean, <laughs> or but yeah. even to authorize, you know, not compelling them, but to permit it. <laughs> permit it, yeah. But you know, these liberals. 
You know, th- th- these types of things find a home. These wild ideas find a home in a lot of sick minds. So liberal yeah. ideas, you know, live in sick minds, sick brains, sick heads. But hey, Gary, you know, we're almost, we got, we, we, we've probably only got about 18 more minutes left in this program. Here it is. I'm always fine. Of the hour. And I think we need to get around to the purpose of what we set aside today to discuss. Let's and what it. I wanted to discuss for the remainder of the program is the constitutional foundation for federal taxation. That's real important. And a lot of people don't know much about it. So let's now start off. And that requires us to go back into time, at to, to the time of the Revolutionary War. So let's say it's 1770. What was going on in 1770 here in North America? Well, we had these 13 colonies, colonies that were under the control of Great Britain. Mm. Now, and th- at that stage, back at the, during that time, you know, the there were su- there were systems of taxation. These colonial governments imposed and collected taxes. But the primary object of of colonial taxation and after the Declaration of Independence, the primary source of taxation exercised by the state governments was what was called direct taxation, meaning the taxes were imposed upon things, real things, like real property like, you know, physical objects. You know, that was the primary source of revenue for the state governments. Have you studied that period of time, Gary? Well, you know, it uh, it goes back, and I, the first thing that came to my mind is the, you know, the Boston Tea Party. Uh, well, that, that that was a tax that was being imposed by Great Britain, and the proceeds were to go to Great Britain. You know, there were certain taxes in the colonies that had been imposed for something different than the support of the colonial government. There were taxes imposed by, you know, England, and the benefit of those taxes, the money was to go to England. So, but what was your comment about the Boston Tea Party? Well, you know, that took place in the early 1770s. And uh, the, the, the tax was so burdensome that uh, the people just revolted against it and said, hey, enough. You know, of course, I mean, in the, the you know, the early 2000s, <clears throat> to mid two thousand to two thousand nine, you know, the, then we had the the Tea Party movement, and you know, we I think that's one of the first times that the majority of the people in this country actually got together and considered it. Right, right, <clears throat> right. And you know, and they call it the Tea Party movement. Well, uh, but as but as far as you, know, Larry, it's just to me, if people were just to to spend a little time. Going back through your your website, which to me and and I mean I'm not biased, is the is the most extensive resource, the most extensive library of cutting to the chase material. You know, everything on the Dixie Land Law Journal has a specific application, and it there's no fluff, there's no waste, and. Uh, if everybody just to spend a little time on it, <clears throat> and you know, and I, you know me, Larry. I, well, hey, I, I know Gary. We got the music coming on. Sure is. Hey, folks, we got the music coming on. Letting us know we got our last break. Heading into our last segment. Stay tuned. We got another segment. We'll be getting around to the purpose of this program today. And welcome back to the final segment of this afternoon's show, the Truth Attack Hour. We've been talking about the. Constitutional found there's a history of the Constitutional Foundation for the taxing powers laid out in the United States Constitution for the federal government. 
And let me come to the point and outline those for you. On July the 3rd of 1776, all powers of taxation in this country were possessed by the state, by the colonial governments. And slowly those colonial governments had been declaring themselves to be states. And that was the purpose of the Declaration of Independence. And the Declaration of Independence is also the beginning of a more formal structure for a government, a federal government, an external government for the states called the United States of America. You know, that really became uh, solidified on July 4th of 1776. However, you know, later on during the course of the Revolutionary War, they created the Articles of Confederation. There was a government of the United States of America that arose under the Articles of Confederation. However, the Articles of Confederation created a federal government that had no powers of taxation. And the only way that the federal government under the Articles of Confederation could do anything is they could make they could get funds to do things by making requisitions to the states. That was a very serious problem. And the way both the colonies, and this is a little bit separate, separate issue, but the way that the colonies and Uncle Sam, the federal government, got the resources for the Revolutionary War, those resources were obtained by those governments by issuing fiat money that soon became utterly worthless. Continental. Not worth a continental. <laughs> and, of course, the federal government had to issue these pieces of paper because it had no powers of taxation. Now, when the war ended in 1783, uh, the federal government, under the Articles of Confederation, still continued. But it had no, no, uh, no powers of taxation. The war being over... The colonies, the states, so to speak, really, you know, they were no longer colonies, they were states. They had their own powers of taxation. The power of taxation that they were exercising was primarily the power of direct taxation. However, the federal government, established by the Articles of Confederation, had no new, no powers of taxation. And because of this problem and other problems... By the early part of 1787, you know, there was a movement to send people to Philadelphia to meet and confer and propose improvements to the Articles of Confederation. However, when the delegates from the states arrived in Philadelphia and spent the next, you know, three months in Philadelphia, they, they they came to the, the uh, conclusion early on that hey amending the articles articles of confederation really what 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 was needed what was needed was an entirely new constitution. So while they were debating in the summer of 1787 in Philadelphia this new constitution for the federal government, they had to deal with the question of federal taxation. They were going to give the government to be created by this new constitution. They were going to be giving it a power of taxation. Well, that power of taxation, you know, the delegates from the states, they didn't want Uncle Sam to invade the same resources, tax resources, that were then the primary sources of revenue for the states. So a decision was made, well, you know, We'll give Uncle Sam uh, a primary source of revenue based upon not direct taxes, but upon indirect taxes, which are commonly referred to by the classifications, the titles, excises, duties, and imposts. So the Philadelphia Constitution, you know, wanted Uncle Sam. It gave a power of taxation 
to the federal government, but that ta- that the, the federal government was to uh, derive most of its revenue from indirect taxes. And so to make sure that Uncle Sam imposed primarily indirect taxes, the rule for the imposition of such taxes was that it may merely be uniform. Now, that's the same thing that happens at the state level to ensure that, you know, you know, if you take a look at most state constitutions, and most state constitutions are looking for, you know, they, they deal with the rules for state legislative bodies, how they shall impose direct taxes. And the rule, primary rule, common rule that you find in the state constitutions is that the power of uh, direct taxation by these state legislatures is likewise that they be uniform. So you, you, this rule of uniformity, you know, meaning like a percentage, the rule of uniformity exists at the state and federal levels, and that rule of uniformity is an indicator of what the framers of a constitution intended for that legislature to use in the way of a taxing power. At the state level, the states are going to be using the power of direct taxation for its revenue, and the common constitutional rule regarding state constitution in reference to imposing taxes on well, on property, direct taxation, those laws must simply be uniform. Well, the same rule applies at the federal level in reference to, you know, what is the federal government's primary source of revenue going to be? It's going to be indirect taxes, the excise duties and imposts, and the rule there is that they merely be uniform. However, the Philadelphia Convention also envisioned this. There might be a an emergency that the federal government might face, like a war, where it might have to impose direct taxes and invade the revenue sources of the states. And so the Constitution provides that all federal direct taxes have to be apportioned. Now, Gary, have you got a a quick little uh, description of how you go about apportioning a federal tax? I believe so, Larry. And and, and the two key words that I think that we should take away is uniformity and apportionment. <clears throat> now, the apportionment, as I understand it, is say, for example, California's got 10% of the, the entire population of the United States. <clears throat> and you take all that 100% and you, you divide it up by the population of each of the states. And say, for example, California's got 10% of the national population and the tax is $100 million. California would be responsible for 10% of 100 million, which would be 10 million. A state right. that has only 5% would be paying 5 million. But if you add it all up, you'd have every state paying the exact same amount for each head, capitation, each head of uh, the, the citizens in each state. That would be apportionment. Very good description. Very good description. Although, you know, I think California's got, uh, for for illustration purposes, you know, California is typically used in arguments like this, or 10% of the population. But they do they have more than 10%, Gary? <laughs> they they got a whole bunch of aliens there now, I think. Yeah. It's a, you know, it's, it's got a lot more going on, you know, and, and we could argue that there's so many people there that they're actually living on the sidewalks, but that might be another problem for another discussion. Yeah, <clears> sure. <throat> well, hey, listen, we've only got a, maybe about three or four minutes. This uh, this this subject is going to have to spill over into next week. But th- th- this is the point I want to make, you know, that there was a split. Back in the 1787 time frame, you know, there was a enough heads that were presented with this problem of, well, what is the primary source of revenue for state governments, and what is the primary source of revenue for the federal government, 
And it was decided that the states were going to have the power of direct taxation and that the federal government, uh, authorized by the United States Constitution, it was going to have to rely primarily upon indirect taxes as its primary source of revenue. So when the Constitution was ratified by the, you know, first it was ratified by nine states, and then the remainder of the states came into the Union, you know, when Congress got organized, you know, the federal government under the Constitution got organized by 1790. It's sitting in, you know, the Congress is sitting in Philadelphia because we hadn't been, we hadn't had Washington, D.C. created at that time. But the Congress had sat in Philadelphia for the first time. One of the very first acts that it imposed was a tax bill. And the tax bill was an indirect tax. And from that point forward, all the way up until the War of 1812, Uncle Sam's revenues were derived primarily from excise taxes, taxes on foreign trade. Is that easy enough to understand, Gary? Absolutely. And and as far as that goes, is you know uh, the importation. Uh, we can kind of put it in in a light very close to what's going on with the tariffs between you know the United States and China. The yes, uh, that that tariff is a tax. Now, some people complain that it's it's, it's taking money out of the American people's pockets, but that's that's a separate argument. But that's one way of raising revenue and balancing the trade. So uh, taxation is is a very interesting creature. And the very first tax act there, I believe, is uh, you know 1861, 1862. Well, it refers to income taxes. In, but Gary, in, we're, in we're down tax. to I've got it at the time of 552. And before we get into the Civil War, you know, I think we need to. You know, I'd like to start off maybe next week dealing with. You know how we got around to the first income taxes, and that's in the Civil War. But we've got a long way. We got sixty years before we get up to the Civil War, and you know we uh, did the first, the first direct tax that Uncle Sam imposed was during the War of eighteen twelve. And if you take a look at that law, it imposed a federal tax upon property. And yet the tax was apportioned. And so you have there that the, what happened in, with the War of 1812, you know, you have, uh, Congress living off of, driving its revenue primarily from the indirect excise taxes all the way until that time, until as an example of a direct tax, and with the War of 1812, you got, you know, now you can see through that history, Congress utilizing both of its constitutional powers of taxation. And when it imposed a direct property tax on land, it apportioned the tax. But that apportioned direct tax was only in effect for a short period of time because the War of 1812 was not very long. And after that war was over with, you know, the federal government's primary sources of revenue then went back to these indirect excise taxes. And Gary, that kind of leads us up to the Civil War time frame. And next week, we're going to be covering, you know, this constitutional history, this history of federal taxation. You'll be doing a lot of the talking then, won't you? I look forward to it. And folks, be sure to come back next week. We're going to be continuing this educational program. See you next weekend. Have a great weekend. Roll Tide. <laughs> Thank y'all for tuning in. And LSU, Gary. I didn't hear it. LSU. Go Tigers. I'm waiting for that second weekend in November, Larry. <laughs>